to look at um, Matthew chapter 9. I was perplexed. I was a little bit torn between a couple of different things, but I believe this, this will be for the house today. Um, if you don't know, if you've never heard me preach, I am a teacher by nature. I like for us to preach and celebrate and have a good time, but I like for us to know what we celebrate and then dancing about. Amen. So if you don't mind, allow me some time to really build our case for this morning. I won't hold you long, I promise you. Matthew 9, verse number 18. We're going to focus in on verse number 18 through 26. We'll read these few verses, and then we're going to hear what God has to say. Read along silently with me. Verse number 18, King James Version. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But then Jesus turned him about and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good cheer, be of good comfort, because thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Everybody shout that hour. Yeah. How many believe in God for that hour type of thing? I can't get no help. How many believe in God for that hour? While I'm sitting here, my miracle is happening. While I'm in the building, my miracle is happening. While I'm watching online, my miracle is happening. While I'm coming into the building from the parking lot, my miracle is happening. Verse number 24, he said unto them, give place, for the maid is not dead. Excuse me, let me go back to 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. For the few moments that we have here this morning, I'd like to use as my title, More Than Enough. I need you to high-five somebody next to you and tell them more than enough. If somebody didn't high-five you, I need you to find somebody and high-five them and say more than enough. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, right now I ask that you open our hearts to receive all that you want to say and do in this moment. We come against any distractions, any hindrances. Right now, prepare our hearts to not just hear a word today but to also apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. On your way to your seat, just push somebody real quick and say more than enough. More than enough. Somebody shout more than, more than enough. Let's set the text up a little bit. Um, I want you to know that there's something happening in this text and I want you to pay very close attention because when we pick up this passage, we find that Jesus is talking about putting wine into new wineskins and how we shouldn't put new wine into old wineskins. It's right in verse 17. We didn't read it. We read 18. But if you just look back up just one verse, you'll see verse 17. This is where he is talking about not putting new wine in old wineskins. Can I say that one of the things that we're going to have to do in this season, and I believe this is for evangel, and this is for Word of God Fellowship and churches all across the globe that will receive this, we're not going to be able to put old wine into new wineskins. This is the reason why y'all have video walls and screens and the musicians got he headphones on now. We're trying to modify how we do things because we're not going to be able to do new things with old methods. The old methods may not work in this season right now. And so Jesus is telling them, even 2,000 years ago, he's telling them, you're not going to be able to put old wine in new wineskins. 
And but guess what happens in this particular passage? I believe that uh, I like to say our, uh, an old wine skin shows up in verse 18. This old wine skin is named Jairus. He's the leader of the synagogues and he has come to, f- to the foot of Jesus because he needs the new wine because that old wine wasn't working. Is it amazing that sometimes we come to Jesus when what we were doing doesn't work anymore? Jairus is trying to get something different because what he was used to wasn't going to work anymore. Or else his daughter would not even be dead. If he was so prominent and powerful, then why couldn't he lay his own hands on his own daughter and raise his own daughter from the dead? He had to now come to the foot of Jesus and beg Jesus, come touch my daughter. He needs new wine because his old wine is not working. Jairus has a, a, a daughter, and in Luke's account, it tells us in Luke 8.42 that this daughter was 12 years of age, and she's on the verge of death. But here in Matthew, it says, my daughter is now dead. So you got one account that's saying on the verge, and you got another account that's saying now. But it's three accounts because in Mark chapter 5, he talks about is on the way to death as well. But there's three different memories of the story. However, all three do agree as as to the substance of the account. And in Luke, she's almost dead. In Matthew, she's now dead. In Mark, they come and tell him while they're talking that she died. So it's, it's all around the same thing. But what I want you to look at here is that this daughter, in my mind, this man, Jairus, is a prominent man. He's a wealthy man. He, he's the ruler of the synagogue. So in my mind, I picture uh, this daughter. She's in a beautiful dress. She's at a beautiful house. And she, she, she's technically the pampered princess of this rich leader of the synagogue. And he loves her, his daughter so much that he, that, that he leaves the house to go to Jesus. He loves her more than his title. He loves her more than his position. The question that I want to ask is is how do you know that? It's because he doesn't send a servant to Jesus. He doesn't send for Jesus privately by night like Nicodemus. No, in the middle of the street, in the middle of the day, in the middle of a crowd, he falls down at the foot of Jesus and begs him to come. Elbow your neighbor and say, how bad do you want it? No, elbow somebody else and say, how bad do you want it? Is he more important? The reason why you're sitting here, I believe, because you're asking yourself the question, is the Savior more important than my title? Is worshiping God more important than my job? Is washing my car on Saturday morning because I couldn't, on Sunday morning because I didn't do it on Saturday, more important than being and having a relationship with God? Is it more important to you than other people's opinion of you? What they're going to say and think about who you are and what you've done. What I love about Jairus is he loves his daughter so much that he falls at the feet of Jesus and begs him to come to his house. Have you ever found yourself needing Jesus that bad? This is for some real people in here. Don't mind being honest and transparent. I'm in church this morning, so I got to say that there has been some times in my life where I needed him that bad badly that I am willing to forsake my title. I am willing to forsake who I am and what I represent. I am that desperate for him. The question is this. How bad do you want him? Are you willing to admit the fact, do you have enough awareness uh, to admit that that, that you are desperate for a move? Desperate for a touch. Desperate for a word from God in this season of your life. I need you to just make some noise. Just holler at me real quick. Make this declaration with me if you don't mind. 
I need Jesus at my house right now. My doors are always open for Jesus. I declare that there's a breakthrough at my house right now. While I'm sitting here, there's a breakthrough at my house. While I'm worshiping him, there's a breakthrough at my house. I came to church. My husband is sitting at the house. My wife is sitting at the house. My children ain't at the house, but my Jesus is sitting right there. My miracle is waiting for me. While I'm sitting here giving God my best, my miracle is at the house waiting. My breakthrough is at the house. My deliverance is at the house. Elbow your neighbor and tell him, he's coming to my house. I came to tell you, I don't mind admitting this, my brother, that I'm so glad that my Jesus made house calls. I'm glad he made a house call for me. Wherever your house was, maybe it was in the crack house, maybe it was in the wine house, maybe it was in the other kind of house. I ain't going to say it because we're sitting in the house of the Lord. But maybe it was a different kind of house. Maybe it wasn't this house, but maybe it was somebody else's house that you knew you shouldn't have been at. But wherever you was at, my Jesus came to my house, pulled me up, turned me around, cleaned me whiter than snow then place me on solid ground. I'm talking about Jesus. Maybe you don't have that testimony. Maybe you can't get that excited because you ain't been through nothing. I love being with Christians who are not just from never, never land. You ain't never went through nothing. You ain't never had no problems. You ain't never lost nothing. You ain't never had no issues. You ain't never had a problem. I'm talking to some people who say, you know what? I'm not Peter Pan, but I am who I am. And I'm glad that God came, brought me from a mighty long way. I love the fact that he did this. Then took everything I did, threw it in the sea of forgetfulness. I don't know about you, but there's some things that I know I need to forget. I don't ever want to remember. I don't ever want to recall. I don't want to ever have a recollection of what had me bound. He came to my house. I need you to elbow five people and tell them he came to my house. He came, he came, he came, he came to my house. I, 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 he came to my, I, I see, I see it all on your, he came to my house with the needle in my arm. Looking at porn, he came to my house. Every saved man in this place know exactly what I'm talking about. Deep down inside, you can look back over your life and say, I'm glad. I'm sitting here a changed person. I'm sitting here a different person. I'm so glad I ain't got to cuss nobody out no more. I'm so glad I ain't got to give somebody a piece of my mind. I'm so glad I ain't got to pull my gat out no more. I'm so glad. Y'all better be glad he changed me too. Because I was out of control. He came to my house. Can I go deeper? As I studied the text uh, further, I saw that Jairus had what I call a come to my house and lay your hand on my daughter kind of faith. I couldn't make it no shorter. In other words, the level of faith that he was operating on required that Jesus come to his house and that Jesus touch his daughter. But the woman with the issue of blood doesn't have come to my house faith. She has another level of faith. Everybody shout another level. This going to bless you real good. She has another level of faith. She has I will come to you faith. And you don't have to lay your hands on me because I will lay my hands on you. 
want to talk to some people this morning that say, you know what? You may not have to come to my house. I'll come to you. Don't worry. I'll come to you, Jesus. You're sitting here this morning because you said, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I ain't going to wait. I'm going to come to you because I need something now. And if I got to wait till after service is over, that might be too long. This might be my only chance. Let me get in my car. Let me brush my teeth. Let me shower up, put some good clothes on, and get to the house of God because I, 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 I need, I need to touch. I don't need to touch him physically. I can touch his him. I can just be in his presence and receive what I need. Because his presence is just that thick. There's a presence in this place right now. There's a still, calm presence of the Holy Spirit that's in your place. And I believe that if you open up your heart, if you open up your mind, if you open up your spirit, then you can receive what you need right now. I believe that there's breakthrough happening right now. There's a miracle happening right now for somebody. Somebody is believing for something. Somebody has the faith for something. And they're saying, Pastor, all I got is a little mustard seed. He said, that's all you need. All you need is just a little bit of faith. And I'll meet you where you are. I believe that this is teaching us that Jesus responds to the level of faith. Get this, the level of faith that you have. Oh, y'all getting ready to get blessed right now. Some of you may have come to my house faith. Then he'll come to your house. But if you have, I'm coming to your house faith, God, then you can get your miracle right now. I need you to praise God like your life depended on it right now. Just... Just, just, just give them the best you got right now. Whatever it sounds like, maybe it's hallelujah, maybe it's thank you, Jesus, maybe it's I need it right now, God. Maybe you need to say I receive it right now. Whatever it is. See, what I have learned is that people come to church, but they leave their prophetic declarations at home. The reason why you just sit there and look is because you don't understand that God is calling for a radical response. See, when you have a radical response, God says, okay, now you're ready. But if you just sit there normal like you normally do with your hands folded, with your, with your, with your finger on your ear like, like God didn't do nothing for you, like you don't need nothing from God, maybe you all got it all together with your highfalutin self and you drink water with your pinky in the air. But I'm talking to some desperate people who say, God, I'm not that bougie. I need something right now. I'll give you a radical praise. I'll give you a radical hallelujah because I need a radical miracle. How many got that kind of faith that you say, God, I'll give you the best praise I got from the front to the back. If I got to run around the church, if I got to jump up and down, if I got to shimmy and shake, whatever you got to do, get the best praise you can. Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout glory. Come on, do a road check. Say, you got to say glory. I need some glory on my road. Don't mess up my glory. Don't mess up my miracle. My miracle is in motion right now. Don't you dare mess that thing up. That's all right. I've heard, I've, heard, I've heard these stories preached so many times in my life, but I've never had anybody, I've never heard anybody preach them together. It's amazing to me that while Jesus was on the way to heal this 12-year-old daughter, this woman with the issue of blood stops him in his tracks. This is not two days later. This is not a month later. This is not four chapters later. This was in that same moment. Can I tell you something? 
can I, can I pause right here and tell you I'm jumping way ahead, but I feel a tug of the Holy Spirit on me right now. There's some people in here that are doubting. There's some people in here that, that are not able to walk in the level of faith that, that somebody sitting next to you have. Can I tell you that my Lord has more than enough? He has more than enough. And he will come to the level of faith that you're on. It's like water. It rises to the level of your faith. And each and every one of us have different levels of faith. That's why he says, I've dealt every man the measure of faith. And that's okay. It's fine. Whatever measure you have, whatever type of faith you have, I just need you to have some faith. Some of us will have, I need him to touch me faith. And others will have, I can touch him and get my breakthrough faith. It doesn't really matter. Whatever you got is whatever you need to get your breakthrough. Can I say that again? Whatever kind of faith you got is the faith that you need to get your breakthrough. Let me talk to the people in the balcony. The faith that you got is the faith that you need to get your breakthrough. Let me talk to the people online because y'all just left me hanging. The faith that you got, the level of faith that you got is the faith that you need to get your breakthrough. Put somebody and tell them I got what I need. Can we go deeper? I promise you I'm almost done. Another thing I realized in the text that is that Jairus only asked for Jesus to come. He only asked Jesus to come. But it's amazing to me that when they got Jesus, he got the disciples too. Because you can't get Jesus without other people coming. Let me break that down for you. Anytime God does something in your life, Anytime you have a testimony, anytime you get blessed, how many know if God bless you with a new house, everybody want to come to your house? Oh, y'all want to act like I'm not talking. Uh, can I talk to the real side over here? Let me talk to the real. Y'all on the right side. Let me talk to the right side. Uh, uh, have you ever known that when you get a blessing and you got a testimony and God gave you a breakthrough, everybody want to come? Because when you got Jesus in your life, when Jesus is doing something great in your life, then others are going to be drawn. This is one of the problems of the modern church. And I love the internet. I love live streaming. But we've gotten people used to the thought of just getting Jesus and not getting fellowship. Of just getting Jesus and not getting community. And while that's necessary, that was necessary in COVID, and that was necessary if you're sick in your body, uh, but I have to let you know that Jesus always comes with people. You don't believe me? Ask Martha. She invited Jesus and 12 other Negroes showed up. Ask the wedding couple at Cana. They invited Mary and Jesus and all his disciples showed up. They drank up all the wine because I have learned that you don't get Jesus without getting other people. Now, if you're following the text, here comes the hijack of the text. This is the gangster moment in the text. Because she hijacks this miracle in broad daylight. Jairus is in the front leading Jesus to his house. Jesus is in the middle of the whole crowd. But this woman with the issue of blood is in the back. It is not her goal to get to his head. It is not her goal to get to his hands. But it is her goal to just touch his him. Some of us will never get a miracle because we're so focused on getting to his head. Can I break that down for you real quick? Uh, we're trying to convince Jesus to heal us. 
We're trying to convince Jesus to give us a miracle. We're trying to convince him and, 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 and play mind games with him, but you can't play mind games with him. Some of us will never get a miracle because we're so focused on getting to his hands. We're trying to dictate and control how he does it. Hmm. I'm getting ready to help you. Uh, we crave that he touch us in a certain way that we have prescribed and we have scripted in our mind. And if it doesn't happen just like that, then we can't see that it's a miracle. And God is saying, you can't try to force my hand. I'm going to give it to you how you need it just at the time that you need it. We wanted him to do it in a specific way, one specific way. But this is how I have it written, God. This is my declaration. This is what I've said. This is how it should happen. And I don't think that it should go any other way. And if it doesn't happen like this, then I'm not going to shout. I'm not going to dance. I don't want to dance because my struggle is too real right now. I'm sitting in church, but I'm going through hell right now. I'm sitting in church, but everybody is, 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 is doing me wrong. And God is saying, what if what is happening to you is for your own good? Because the Bible declares that all things work together. That means my good, my bad. That means my losses and my gains. That means my sickness and my health. He takes all of that and mushes it together and say, it's going to work together for your good. Push somebody say, it's working together. Come on, push somebody say, it's working together for my good. But the way that Jesus operates is it's not his head. You're not going to be able to talk him into it. It's not his hand. You're not going to call the shot for how this is going to happen. But I declare that it's his him. It's his presence. In other words, you're going to have to get low enough to grab it. You're going to have to get low down to get what you need from him. I need you to ask yourself this question. Don't ask nobody else. Don't look to the left or the right. Just point at yourself. How low am I willing to go? Are you willing to get low in the dust? Are you willing to get low and get dirty for God? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? She's willing to get down from behind on the ground. She don't need a conversation. She don't need a meeting. She don't need an interview. She don't need a questionnaire. She don't even need to talk to the disciples. She is literally already in her own faith zone and says, my faith. No, let me say it like this. Uh, Pastor Otis, my now faith is the substance of what I am hoping for. So sometimes I may have to do something radical. Because if I don't do something radical, then I don't have anything that I'm hoping for. Your radical miracle could be attached to your radical act of faith. I don't know what that radical act of faith is for you. But whatever it is, you have to now tap into that in this season of your life. Because if you don't, then you will miss moments where you can prove to God that he can trust you in the worst moments, the low moments, the down moments of your life. He can never take you high if he can't trust you low. Her faith was so high that she is willing to get low. Are you willing to get on your knees? Are you willing to lay prostrate before the Lord? Are you willing to go as low as you can just for him? Because this woman is so desperate that she hijacks the healing. So much so that Jesus doesn't even know who did it. 
That's a problem because we don't like Jesus not knowing. But no matter how you chop it up, we have three different accounts of him not knowing who touched him. And then it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all agree that Jesus stops and says, who touched me? I want to ask the question, who is touching him? This woman had so much faith that she was willing to crawl just to touch at him, just to be in his presence. She's so low that she's willing to do whatever it takes. I'll come to church every day on Holy Week because I just need your presence. She's desperate enough. She hijacks the miracle and she pulls a miracle out of them. Are you desperate enough Gangster enough to pull a miracle from him. I'm desperate enough. I know you got your miracle and you get yours, but you're going to have to yank the same time I'm yanking because this one is for me. I'm praying that the same grace that's on Pastor Otis Jr.'s life is on my life too. And in some seasons, you got to yank that thing. I'm willing to pull a miracle out of him. I'm willing to pull on him so much that he's got to ask, who touched me? Some of us are sitting here healed right now from cancer, healed from diseases, healed from things in your body, and God delivered you and healed you. And now he's saying, who touched me? Me. Who? And in one account, Peter is like, Jesus, everybody is touching you. Jesus says, but yeah, I felt the virtue come out of me. I believe that there's some people in here, at least 50 of you, that are saying, God, I will pull on you. I will yank on you. Just reach up and grab what you need from them. I need you to do something prophetically. Just reach up and grab. Just snatch it. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Begin to just prophesy to yourself that I'm getting my miracle. I'm receiving my miracle. I'm going to get my miracle in Jesus' name. If I got to hijack a miracle, I'll hijack it. If I got to snatch a miracle, I'll snatch that miracle. The enemy been trying to convince me that it's not my time, but the devil is a liar and all his cousins is a liar too. I'm going to get mine right now in Jesus' name. I need about you. I need about 10 of you just to say, I'm going to get mine right now. It's my time now. It's my time now. It's my season right now. Y'all can keep going. That's right there. This passage is so powerful because it suggests stuff that makes theologians nervous. But we have to understand that the entire text is the object lesson for his discussion on new wine. This whole text is the object lesson for his teaching on an unorthodox, unscheduled, uncontrollable miracle. Because what I have found is that faith doesn't make sense. It makes miracles. I can't get no help in here. I've learned that faith, whatever level of faith you have, it doesn't make sense. It makes miracles. And I'm just radical enough to believe that there's some uncontrollable, unorthodox, unscheduled things that's getting ready to happen in somebody's life this morning. Your pastor is going to receive testimonies from some of you that said, Pastor, while I was sitting there, there was a breakthrough happening in my life. While I was sitting there, I got healed in my body. 
Pastor, I went to the doctor and they told me that the lumps that they saw that are there, they're no more. Because he's in this season right now, in this atmosphere, those of you that have enough faith to believe it, that there is something unorthodox, unscheduled, and uncontrollable, a miracle that's getting ready to blow through your body. And I came to prophesy to somebody today that this is your time for an unorthodox I decree and declare that this is the time for an unscheduled. I decree and I declare that this is a time for an uncontrollable miracle to break out in your life today. If you believe that, I need you to just open up your mouth and just begin to say, I receive it. No doubtedly, Jesus is on his way. I got to close. He's on his way to raise up a girl who is 12 years old from the dead. On the other hand, this woman, this woman with the issue of blood, it says that she's been dealing with a dead issue for 12 years. Did y'all hear what I just said? The girl is 12. And the woman with the issue of blood has been dealing with a dead issue for 12 years. It's amazing to me how God can do something at the same time. Similar situation, but in a different time span. Jesus is on the way to wake this 12-year-old girl up. But this woman has been dealing with a dead issue. Had to get healed first. Maybe my God that I serve, no matter what anybody tries to tell you, my God is our own time God. If you believe that, say, yes, he is. My God is our own time God. Yes, he is. Although these women, these young ladies are of two totally different ages and stages. The woman with the issue of blood is able to hijack the anointing that is on Jesus. The same anointing that was on Jesus to raise up this 12 year old thing. And this pickpocketing is done so stealthily that Jesus doesn't even know who the thief is. This woman changes the narrative with an outrageous act of faith. This woman is crawling on the ground, literally changes the whole story so much that they got to find her and bring her to Jesus. She was probably ready to go home. Get out of there. She's able to now walk. She was crawling. But now she can stand up and walk. I'm going to get my healing and go home. Some of y'all, I know some of y'all come to church. You get in the church. You ain't going to greet nobody, speak to nobody, love on nobody. You're going to get what you came to get and get in your car and go home. That was this woman, I believe. She was ready to go. She's not trying to stay around to talk to nobody. She ain't trying to stay around to do no interviews. She ain't trying to do no end of the service wrap up on social media. She ain't on the 700 Club. She got her miracle while crawling, but was walking home. And before she can get out the door, Jesus stops her and puts her on blast. And then she tells him her whole life story. I don't have time to get into it. But this, the Bible declares in the NIV version of Luke that she stops to tell him her whole life story. Her whole life story. 
He just asked who touched me. All she had to say was me. But she's literally telling him her whole life. Well, you know, I heard that she was coming. And, uh, and so I decided to, to, to I had to uh, uh, play back in my mind to determine if I was going to come. And once I finally decided after about five minutes, Lord Jesus, I said, I'm going to go ahead and get up and try to get to you. And then I, so, so I did what I could. I put my clothes on. I was in so much pain. My foot was hurt. My back was hurt. I couldn't barely stand. And, pa and Jesus, do you know that I even called somebody to come pick me up, but nobody answered the phone. And I just began to just sit there and cry and cry and cry. She's telling him his whole, her whole life story. Can you imagine the look on Jairus' face? This woman is hijacking not only the miracle, but the moment. And Jairus is standing there saying, what in the world are you doing, woman? My daughter is dying. Get your miracle and go. Jairus is sitting there frustrated, disappointed, discouraged, losing hope. Probably doesn't know. I believe he did not know that Jesus had more than enough. Hold on a second. He had more than enough to go around. I came to tell you that my Lord has more than enough to go around to everybody. To go around to everybody from this side to that side. From this front to that back. My God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can ask or think. That means why he's touching you, why he's healing you, why he's healing you, why he's healing you. He's doing it all at the same time. Because he has more than enough to go around while he's blessing evangel he's blessing word of God while he's blessing word of God he's blessing your brother's church he's blessing he's touching your business he's touching your children on the college campus because he has more than enough to go around She's standing there telling Jesus her whole life story. Folk done coming from the house saying, trouble not the master. And she done talked so long in the middle of the street that Jairus' daughter is dying. But he's got more than enough to go around. Be not dismayed. Be not discouraged. Because I came to tell you all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina, that he's got more than enough to go around. It ain't just during Holy Week. It's during the whole year. Be not weary in well-doing. In due season, you shall reap if you don't give up. I need you to point to yourself and say, it's my reaping season. Come on, decree and declare, it's my due season. It's my reaping season. This is a tale of two women. I love this text because it shows us that not only does Jesus have the power to heal a mature woman's issues, but he also has enough power to heal a young woman's issues. He can touch this generation while he's touching another generation. He can touch the other generation while he's touching this generation. He's not limited in scope to one generation. He's not limited to white people, brown people, black people. He's not limited to older people or younger people. He can touch all people, men, women, children, senior citizens, teens, young adults. My God has more than enough to go around. Brother, I know that y'all might be thinking the same thing that I was thinking. That while I was studying the text, 
I agree with you that this doesn't seem fair that the woman with the issue of blood gets healed before Jairus' daughter because he actually gets there first. This is getting ready to bless some of you that think that, well, God must have forgot about me. I'm trying to tell you that he hasn't. It's on the way because I'm getting ready to show you how. And it may seem unfair that the woman with the issue of blood came in after Jairus came. said may not be fair but wait a minute Jairus is first and the woman with the issue of blood was last but I decree and declare that the first shall be last and the last shall be first because God is going to do some things in your life he's going to change the order in your life just so he can prove to you that he's God some of you about to lose hope. Some of you have been giving up. And God said, you know what? Before you give up, I'm getting ready to switch it because I don't want to lose you. I don't want to leave. I don't want you to leave me. So I'm getting ready to change the order because I need you to believe like never before. So I'm going to turn some things around because the first shall be last and the last shall be first. I need a person who's been waiting on a move, been waiting on a touch from God. I need you to just give him a praise. Open up your mouth and give him a praise. Come on, I can't hear you. Give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise right where you are. I might be last, but God is now changing the order. He is making me first. I'm talking to some people who said I've been waiting on my miracle. This is your due season. This is your due season. God told me to tell you, brother, this is your due season. I don't know what you're waiting on, but this is your due season. Grab a neighbor by the hand real quick. I need you to prophesy this into their, hand, into their life. I need you to prophesy to them. Tell them, hold on. Don't give up, because this is your due season. God told me he's changing the order. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. God is making you the head and not the tail. God is making you above and not beneath. Brother Antonio, can you come here for a second? Brother Quentin, Brother Tony, where y'all at? Can y'all come here for a second? I need you to do something because some of y'all might need a quick illustration. Can I give it to you real quick? Do me a favor. Uh, I need you to, you just turn right here you go right here, and you just, yeah, arms length. There you go. Y'all y'all already know. Y'all military men, right? Y'all military men? Okay, y'all can tell. Marine Corps. Hoorah. Hoorah. Okay, I hear you. All right. Simplify. Okay. All right. Now, in the military, they have this saying. And before I do the saying, for all points and purposes, if we face him this way, he will be first, right? He will be second. He don't matter this time. And he lasts, right? We got first, we got last. Now, in the military, they have this saying that, that they say, whenever they, whenever the sergeant or whoever says it, Y'all are supposed to respond. But I believe that saying is about face. When you hear about face, what happens when you hear about face? About face. Just that quick, God changed the order. He who was first just became last. And he who was last 
became first. I came to tell you that God is flipping things around just that quick. And he's saying that what you've been dealing with, what you've been struggling with, God said, even though the person that came first But I need you to not be dismayed. Thank God that you're first. Thank God that you're in the middle. I praise God for you because you're last. But just like the word of God says, I have more than enough to go around. So just because he gets to you first, doesn't mean he don't have enough. I don't care how long you've been dealing with it. God said, I got more than enough. Mother, I got more than enough. To heal your body, to restore everything that the canker worm tried to take from you. My God is telling me that He is strong enough, He is powerful enough to touch your body, to touch your mind, heal every. <laughs> place that has been obstructed by the enemy. I decree and declare that there's healing flowing in your body. Whatever ailment or issue the devil sent your way, I decree and declare that it is gone in Jesus' name. Somebody say more than enough. While he's healing her, he's got more than enough to go around and heal every place, every void, everything. In this season, thank y'all, gentlemen. Twelve years. Twelve years this woman was battling with this dead issue. Twelve years. This young girl was twelve years old. And yet Jesus was powerful enough to get to the young girl in time. He's not too late. Your situation ain't that dead where Jesus can't resurrect it. Where Jesus can't touch it. Where Jesus can't raise it. He's doing it right now. If you have enough faith in your heart to believe, I believe he's doing it. I connect my faith with those who right now, who are saying, I need it right now. I connect my faith with yours. That he's touching that place. healing is flowing if I'm not mistaken it's interesting to me that this was 12 years this young girl was 12 years old and one with the issue blood was dealing with a dead issue for 12 years Pastor Otis had no idea what I was going to talk about. But I called him out the blue and I said, how many years has it been since your father transitioned and you took over? He told me it was 12 years this October. I came to prophesy to you today, sir, that this is going to be the greatest season of your life. Make no mistake. That God heard every cry. God heard every prayer. And what I want you to know is that he even heard the prayers that you stopped praying. Because he's also hearing the prayers that your mom prayed. The prayers that your wife is praying. The prayers that everybody that's connected to you is praying. I came to tell you that God is hearing every prayer that's associated with the miracle that's happening in your life 
an evangel's life and that your best years are right in front of you. God is doing something different with this number 12. He's doing something different with this number 12. I've never in my life looked at the text this way until now. And I believe God showed it to me for a reason. Because as you're walking in your blessing, as you're walking in your this prophecy, God is getting ready to touch everything connected to you. God is getting ready to touch everybody connected to you. Here's the blessing. Whatever that's not attached to him can't hurt what God is going to do for him. Because what God has for you is for you. And I came to tell you he's got more than enough. Brother, come here. In the, in the blue sweatshirt, come here. God told me to lay hands on you right now. You've been feeling inadequate. You've been feeling like a failure. You've been feeling like God don't hear you. You might be saying, why is this man calling me out right now? And it's because the Spirit heard you. And God said, I'm getting ready to touch all of that. Yes. And when you go back home, you're going to come you're going to walk in that house with a different level of confidence because what this that is happening for you now, it's a move from God. This is not physical. This is not carnal. This is spiritual. And my faith is connecting with yours right now because he's touching every broken place. Whoever said something about you, talked about you, everybody's opinion about you, what you did, how you did it, don't matter no more. Because what God is doing in you, he's going to get the glory for it. Lift your hands and receive it. Father, do a new thing in this man of God. Touch him like never before. And his life will be a testimony to those he come in contact with in Jesus' name. God bless you. God is doing something.